you fucking fight back Hey guys, welcome to this special episode of the Passionate Few Podcast. Today, we're in Arizona, live at the Lion's Den with none other than the man, the myth, the legend himself, Andy Elliott. Thanks so much for being on the show, Andy. Cool, man. So it's cool to uh, turn the tables. I know we're in your studio here, but I'm going to be interviewing you. So before people heard about this Andy Elliott guy that came out of nowhere this last few years, you built this $100 million sales company. You become the fastest growing sales trainer on the internet. People all over the world, country are talking about you. But take me back before you were this this badass six pack, uh, you know, inspired guy. Where did young Andy Elliott grow up, and where did this journey all begin for you as a kid? Yeah, so uh, two years old. Um, well, number one, I was born in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. right? Um, just every kid, usually um, who their parents are, is kind of like who they grow up to become, mm-hmm. right? Like what they see, the relationship they have with them, the love they get. Um, mom left when I was two, right? Usually dads roll out. But like my mom left out. So I was raised as a pretty cold kid because I think like moms like instill love in their kids. Mm -hmm. So I was a pretty cold kid. Didn't have the manners. I mean, you'd agree like men usually don't teach their men. men, The dads teach the the kids to be tough, Mm -hmm. the boys to be tough. Um, I had a dad who was kind of a pushover, Mm -hmm. right? Love my dad. But my dad ain't going to speak up, man. It just ain't going to happen. He doesn't want to cause any conflict. So growing up, it was like no conflict, like. You know what I'm saying? Like, because that was what my dad taught me. Then my mom left, so I was pretty cold-hearted. Mm-hmm. Um, we were very. When I say poor, I mean like, like we didn't live like in the ghetto, but like we never had anything. Like, hey, dad, can I have five bucks? I want to go do this. There's no money for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't have air conditioning in the house. Like, so like growing up, there was no air conditioning in our house. Mm-hmm. So I'm not gonna say poor because I know people live like poor, 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 right? Yeah. But like we just didn't have anything. There was no extra money. So growing up, we lived in an area in Norman, Oklahoma. We're like, there was a lot of rich kids and we actually like, like my, those were my friends and growing up, I knew that I was the poor kid. Mm. Like I knew like, so my friends, like, cause you know, kids don't know rich or poor, right. but you can kind of tell like the Nike shoes, yeah. you know, they had like these Jabo nice jeans. Yeah. They had something. nice cars. My dad drove a Dodge Neon. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and, and that was like his new car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, you know, like the other people had the nice, nice cars. Right. Um, you know, we had never had more than a $1,500 car or something growing up. And then my dad, barely when I was about out of school, bought a brand new Dodge Neon. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, it was like a special finance deal you got approved. But like, right. we were so excited. Crank windows, five speed, no air, <laughs> Dodge Neon. Dad got a new one. Woo! What color was it? It was blue, yeah. right? I think they probably gave him one color. <laughs> like you can get the blue one with no air, yeah. uh, stick, crank windows, you know, 1500 down yeah. and you're approved were you only child or do you have siblings yeah so i got five brothers and sisters so growing up is kind of like the jerry springer shit show in our house like mm. it was kids raising kids and now i want to tell you something like i'm super glad that i was raised the way i was raised mm-hmm. because it, it number one we were poor and i and i knew that we were looked at differently mm-hmm. um i don't think life is fair um i think because i didn't get much love as a kid which this isn't a like a victim deal i craved it as an adult right Okay, so like I shower people with love, I mean, all the time, I think because I didn't get it as a kid, so I want to give that now. Yeah, your biggest void is your biggest value. Yeah, right. like, and like, and since I was poor as a kid, I never had anything. I didn't have choices. I couldn't do anything. I could tell I was being judged. Um, I remember in seventh grade, like, like I kind of started to understand that I would hang out with my friends that had money and their parents would come home. And I was the kid that wore the same pair of clothes every day, the same two pair of clothes, mm-hmm. I'd rotate them. And, you know, I'm not really understanding, but I had a Nirvana shirt. I had this shirt. I'd rotate them every other day. Same pair of jeans, holy pair of Converse. <laughs> you could tell when you walk in, I'm the kid without a mom. I'm the kid whose parent. I mean, like, I don't have to ask for permission to stay the night because my dad doesn't know if I'm coming home for three weeks. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember in the second grade, like, not coming home for, like, three months. And I was in the back of the neighborhood staying at a friend's house. Mm-hmm. And, like, like, it wasn't weird. What did your dad do for a living? My dad was just a chemist. He was just uh, worked for Kerr McGee. And um, honestly, my dad's been married uh, many, many times. So my mom's been married like seven times. So like when you have step parent, and by the way, my steps moms were always really crazy. Mm-hmm. So my dad was always like figuring out how to keep them in line mm-hmm. and us kids ran, ran crazy. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now my dad was kind of hard on my sisters, but cause I was the boy, I got to run the streets. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, but making a point, it's kids raising kids. Where did Andy Elliott come from? Um, seventh grade at first time, I remember that my uh, friend's mom was like, Oh, uh, we're all going to dinner. Mm-hmm. So we need to drop the kids off. Mm-hmm. Like, and that means like the kids friends. Right. 
And they would always drop me off first, but I lived the furthest away. Mm. So like after school, we would walk yeah. to my friend's house, but I lived the furthest away, but for some reason they would always drop me off first. Mm -hmm. And I, I finally started to realize that the parents didn't want me hanging out with their kids because I was poor. Mm. And I, I just, I didn't have a lot of manners. Yeah. I wasn't a bad kid. Just didn't have anyone to look up to. You didn't have a good leader. Yeah, just don't know, man. You know, I probably was a smart mouth. I probably, mm. I mean, just dude, I was probably just needing some love and someone to, but, but because I could tell that I was that poor kid, um, they would drop me off and then the rest of the kids went and ate mm. with the parents. But I got dropped off and they pretended they dropped everybody else off. And I slowly started to realize like the next day, like, man, that was so awesome last night that your mom took us to that place mm -hmm. and we ate. And I was like, man, that was weird because I that got was, dropped off. Yeah. And I started to realize that, dude, like, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I'm going to break the, because I want to paint a picture that like everybody's qualified for a badass life. Um, if you suffer as a, as a kid, usually you kill it as an adult. Um, if you have an easy life as a kid, normally it's very hard for you as an adult because you haven't suffered yet. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to suffer. I suffered my whole life. Um, now, not like I had a bad, bad, bad life, but like I, I, I just felt like I couldn't, I wanted to find my way out. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to be anything like my mom. I didn't want to be anything like my dad. I didn't want to be like anything around me. Nobody believed in me. My dad said, get a job, stay out of jail. You know, I was like rebelling, trying to fit in. And by the way, I never fit in, but they don't make statues of people that fit in. That's a cool thing. So if anybody's like having trouble fitting in, like that's good. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't color in the lines, like do there's something for you. Once you become interested in, you're gonna become dangerous. I'm gonna tell you, I got held back in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And I remember my teacher was like, you have problems. Do listen, I wasn't interested. I was never interested in school. No one ever taught me to be interested in school. So if anybody's ever made bad grades, if they've done bad stuff, once you find something you're interested in, you're like, you're going to kill it. Mm -hmm. and, and I just needed something to plug into. A vehicle. Yeah, yeah. I just, dude, or a, and, a, and a good leader, right? I needed a, a boat to row in, and I needed a good leader at the front of the boat. And, dude, so at 18 years old, I remember this. Well, by the way, I was supposed to fail my senior year. Mm -hmm. I thought we were going to fail. A tornado wipes out my, my school because I live in Norman, Oklahoma, which is Tornado Alley. Yeah. We have an F6 tornado, wipe out our whole school. And they said if you had passing grades, you got to walk. <laughs> and by the way, I had straight 60s on everything, which yeah. means I had to take my semester test, which I was going to fail. Mm -hmm. And that means I was going to get Fs and I would have to redo school again. Well, it wiped out our school. Right. So I graduated. Immediately, I work construction because a tornado wiped our whole town out. Mm -hmm. I work construction for one month. Dude, that was the worst job of my life, man. I picked up I picked up bricks, broken shit, I had fiberglass all in my body. They worked me like hell, paid me a hundred bucks a week to go work from six in the morning till twelve o'clock at night, seven days straight. I was like, dude, I needed money, but I was like, this sucks. At this time, are you driven to be a millionaire and all this? No, no, dude. Thinking, dude, listen to me. Situation. Honestly, I I swear in my life, and I wish I could tell you, like, dude, I always knew I was gonna be something. Mm -hmm. Dude, I didn't know I was going to be something until this happened. So because nobody ever believed in me, and since nobody ever believed in me, and nobody was the leader around me, I didn't really, f and I didn't see anything cool or kick ass around me. By the way, this is 1999. So there's no internet. We can't log into stuff. There's no device. I can't watch people. I mean, yeah. dude, like that stuff doesn't exist. Like there's we're no in a personal self development. Yeah, training. like personal development. There's 15 year olds now that are like getting developed. <laughs> I would have given anything right. to live in, in this era. Go back to 15. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my God, man. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Andy. A lot of you leave comments. Tell me that you need help. Do me a favor. I'm going to tell you the best way to get a hold of me. Shoot me a text message right now. 918-210-0254. 918-210-0254. 2100254. I'll help you with whatever you need. I got your back for life. Let's get back to the video. But so I had a good buddy of mine and uh, his older brother goes, Hey dude, this is what he said. He goes, he goes, you can make $5,000 a month selling cars. He goes, dude, you're pretty good at talking. Why don't you come, why don't you come uh, sell cars? Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, if I made $5,000, I never had $5 in my hand at one time. If I made five thousand dollars a month i would be rich mm -hmm. and i was like done pick me up i'll do whatever mm -hmm. and he was like done dude he's like i'm gonna pick you up at 7 a.m you're gonna shut the gate with me at 11 p.m at night i'm gonna give you some clothes to wear and that's how it's gonna work mm -hmm. 
I showed up the first day. I remember I went outside. They were having a sales meeting. I found a guy. It was a lay down. That just means it was an easy deal. The guy goes, oh, yeah, I'll take that one. I went inside. I didn't know what was going on. My manager said, you know, get a credit app on him. I got a credit app. And I remember it was like yesterday. And then I got the credit app. And the manager goes, this guy's gold. And I was like, dude, gold's got to be good. I'm thinking in my head, like, this is good stuff. And I don't know anything about money. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about money. Nothing about money. I'm an illiterate person, which shows that everything can be taught. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a badass now, and I learned really quick, even at 18, how I started killing it quick. I learned very quick that everything that's a skill can be taught. If it can be taught, I can learn it. Mm -hmm. And I became addicted to learning, and I started getting psycho about learning because I, I made my first commission. And uh, so, how old, were, how old were you that day? I was 18. Mm -hmm. And so he goes, Get a credit app. I got one. He goes, This is gold. And then he goes, Go ask him, what does he want to do? Option A or option B? Have him sign. If you ever went to a car dealership, they give you these numbers. Right. And they're like, Sell price, trade, cash down. Right. This is what your payoff is. And then it says, like, Option A, option B. Maybe 48 months, 60 months. Does that make sense? Right. And, and that, that's what it was. A piece of paper, I don't understand any of this. Mm -hmm. I literally have never had any money, so I clearly couldn't understand yeah. any of this. And he goes, go ask, and I asked this guy, I say, hey, what would you like to do, option A or option B? And I'm just guessing this guy's going to sign. And how nervous are you doing this? Like you're pretending you know what you're doing because it's your first day, but you literally know nothing. I don't know anything what I'm doing. And honestly, yeah. I'm too illiterate to be nervous. I just <laughs> heard he could make 5000 a month. Right. And I just, I want to believe that this is true. Crazy thing. The guy goes, what's the interest rate? And I go, and it's a swear on my life. And I go, the interstate? <laughs> and like, and it sounds funny, but I like to tell people that like, bro, like you can be so lost. And if you'll fall in love with self-development and learning, you'll become dangerous. Now watch what happens. The guy looked at me and I wasn't trying to scam this guy. I didn't have commission breath. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to pull his leg. I just didn't under, the guy goes, don't worry about it. He could tell like yeah. the, the eyes are the window to the soul. He can tell one lying to him. Like, I just didn't understand. And I said, let me go ask my manager. And he goes, no, I'm, I'm okay, Andy. He goes, I'll do option A. The guy signs it. I go back in the office. I hand the paper over to my manager. He goes, are you kidding me? He goes, get this guy in the finance office right now. Let's go. Come on, guys. Get him in the finance office. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All of a sudden, people start moving real quick. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, what the hell is going on? <laughs> like, this is exciting. Yeah. He's like, go get the car washed. I'll take it from here. Mm -hmm. He walks the guy back to finance. I guess that was, it was a big deal, mm -hmm. but I didn't know I had a big deal. Cause I don't know anything about deals. Right. I don't know nothing about nothing. Right. So sometimes being stupid is good. And this is literally your first deal. First, my first deal. And, and anyways, as soon as the guy left, I got his car cleaned up. He came out of finance. Got his guy got in a car and he left. My manager goes, Andy, LA sales tower. He goes, do you know how much money you just made? And this is where it all started. So this is when, this is when my blood started flowing through my veins differently. Mm -hmm. This is when the old me died. David Goggins talks about going to war with his, his old self and his new self. This right. is the first time that the new me came up and was like, you're dead, bro. And it became this fight. And this psycho competitor came out. My manager goes, you know how much money you just made? And remember, I'm poor. I never had any money. I mean, if anything had to do with thousands, would be rich. My dad mm -hmm. bought my first, my dad bought my truck, my only car he ever bought me for $400 cash. Mm -hmm. And when I watched my dad count it out to the guy, I was like, damn, dad, where'd you get that money at? Yeah. Like I had such a small mindset. How much money did you have at your, your, in your bank account at this time? I had zero. I never, I didn't have a yeah. bank account. I've wow. never had a bank account. I never have anything. Yeah. I didn't have a car. I didn't have any money to eat lunch. I didn't even know how I was going to eat lunch at work. Mm -hmm. Like we, I don't think about that. Like just like I needed to just get out. Just, I need, I figured I was going to eat some at some time. Some dude, I've been bumming food my whole life. Mm -hmm. I eat out of everybody else's shit my whole life. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't anything different than now. You know what I'm saying? So like at this point, I'm like, this is just normal life to me. Like, well, we'll I'll, I'll get a sandwich from someone at some point somewhere. I'm going to bum, I'm going to bum yeah. some money. Okay. Yeah. Like I'm going to figure it out. Like that's what you do. You just, you make ends meet. And, uh, he goes, you just made $1,700. And I remember at that point, I almost wanted to get emotional because I was like, I was like, I don't understand. And he's like, you just made $1,700. And he goes, because it's the last day of the month, because today's the first day you're starting, but tomorrow's the last day of the month. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to give you a check for $1,700. He goes, also, Andy, you got the high gross of the month. Mm -hmm. I go, what's that? And he goes, the deal that you did grossed the most gross commission money for the whole month. And that's why whenever they signed the paper, we were all running around because we couldn't believe the guy on the first day, like you, could get the biggest deal all month. Mm -hmm. And you didn't even know what you were doing. Yeah. And you said, the interstate? We heard you. Yeah. And we're over here laughing and you closed it. Yeah. He goes, Andy, you believed, bro. He goes, you're dangerous, man. 
He goes, what you just did, if you can become good with that belief, you're dangerous, man. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dude, I like how you're talking to me. Like, I like this. I never had anybody talk to me like this. He goes, but since you got the high gross of the, of the month, you're also going to get 500 cash tomorrow morning in the meeting. Mm -hmm. And so the next day in the meeting, they're saying, Andy Elliott, first day, 1700 bucks, 500 cash. Everybody's like, oh my God. And then I realized I got lucky. I went a week without selling anything and mm -hmm. I got rejected. And my manager goes, listen, dude, you're going to get lucky and you got to lay down. That's what happened. You got a little layup, bro. Mm -hmm. He goes, now you're going to have to get trained. You got to learn how to communicate. You, you, you stutter a little bit. You got to stop stuttering. You got to learn to speak. You got to learn to write down these word tracks. You got to understand there's the top five objections we get every day. I need to think about it. Got to talk to my wife. Payment's too high. Price too high. I want more for my trade. These things are going to come every day. Mm -hmm. He goes, dude, listen, you're going to get smacked every day. How many times are you going to get smacked for you to learn how to overcome this? He goes, we're going to role play. We're going to practice shaking hands every single day for an, for an hour in the conference room. Dude, I shook hands every day for an hour straight to my manager. How you doing? It's Andy Elliott. Welcome to the store. Welcome to our home. I did this every day over and over. People used to laugh at me. They make fun of me. I took my first paycheck. I went to a Grant Cardone uh, seminar deal. I, I, I took every dollar I had because I wanted, this was my way out. So just anybody understand this. Sales will get you rich. Sales and leadership will get you rich and give you a rich life. Mm -hmm. Like that's the secret. So if anybody wants to kill it, you got to learn sales and leadership. And, I, and leadership didn't come yet, mm -hmm. but that was sales. So I learned all the word tracks. I learned how to speak. I learned moral authority that if I believed in what I was doing, other people would believe in me and what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I started walking around my chest different. I started talking differently, started head nodding people, right? Mm -hmm. Started going and using my hands a lot more. Started smiling with my eyes, started smiling with my teeth. Mm -hmm. Started talking to people like I knew them my whole life, even though I didn't know them. Mm -hmm. I'd walk up to anybody, man, anywhere I was. My manager took me into the mall. Through my manager, like this, he was a psycho dude. Yeah. He took me to the mall and he goes, you're going to walk in here and you're going to shake 500 people's hands and you're going to laugh with them and then you're going to shake someone else's hand. That's what you're going to do. And I'm going to teach you to master a stranger. Wow. And if you can master strangers, you're going to be my top guy. Wow. And so at 18 years old, I made 125 grand my first year. Uh, and this is going back 125, wow. but this is 1999. Yeah. Right. So like we're 25 years ago, mm -hmm. um, at 19 years old, I made 225. And by the way, they told me the most that you could make in the automotive business was 150 grand. That was the most, but I had a new manager that w came into our dealership and he showed me his pay stub and it was 225. He said, I sold cars in Georgia and, and I was like, Oh shit, dude. And like, now I can see it. Now I can make that happen. So then I hit 225 at 19 and I made 500 grand my first year at 20. When I did that. And commissions? Yeah, like that was Holy my shit, W2. Wow. And I made uh, like 570 grand. At and how, how are you changing in this process? Because I'm sure it was like little by little, right? It wasn't. It was, it was gradual, right? It wasn't yeah, just. But you got to remember, I, yeah. yeah, yeah, I was changing really quickly. But mm -hmm. the one thing that I was doing is that, look, I was building self confidence. I was building self esteem. I was building self belief. Were you ladies' um, man at this time? You're yeah, like I was chasing every chick I could get my hands on. Yeah. Dude, but I'm going to explain this to everybody. I don't want you to do that. Here's what I want you to do because this is me, right? Right. Um, I believe the greater your personal life is, like the happier you are with yourself. That's why I'm like a big fitness guy. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the six pack of your fire deal, that came later in life because I always learned in life when I was taking care of myself and when I was physically fit, I was doing really, really good in all these other areas and I was really high achieving. Mm -hmm. And when I wasn't taking care of my physical self very good, I was always playing subpar in mm -hmm. other areas. And so my fitness was a true testament of really what I was doing in these other areas. And honestly, like I'm a person that if I get dressed and I'm looking in the mirror and I don't like me, it's really hard for me to go show a lot of other people love. It's really hard for me to not get in my own way, not self-sabotage myself, not, mm -hmm. not break down. Yeah. Like, yeah. dude, like I'm like, I'm a traitor to me because like, this isn't who I want to be yet. I'm making excuses why I can't do this. And like, and like, I don't like that. So I, I, I was fit at this point. Mm -hmm. I was very fit. I worked out every day. I when gave, you were 18, were you fit or no? Like when, I, when yeah, when I was... started getting really fit. 19, I got really fit. 20, I got really fit. Mm -hmm. I met my wife um, at 26. She was 24. I was really fit. I was really strong. I was kicking ass. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I worked my way up to making about a million a year. I'm just gonna give mm -hmm. an example. Okay. And I became really good at sales. And then, and I never wanted to get promoted. They always kept wanting me to make me the manager, the boss, and whatever. And I didn't want to be in charge of anybody else's results. I enjoyed getting my results. I enjoyed the thrill of the kill. I was a lion. I wanted to hunt. Yeah. I wanted to eat what I killed. Yeah. And I was so scared because, you know, I get, let's say, 25% commission. But now, once you're in charge of a team, you go to 2%, mm -hmm. right, but on 25 people. Right. Over and now I'm like, these guys haven't been as hungry as I am the whole time. And I hear I am doing all this stuff and now I got to rely on these guys. I was like, hell no, man. I like winning for me. Mm -hmm. My wife's like, 
And when I got with her, she's like, it's time for you to go to the next level. And I told her, I was like, babe, and that's when leadership came in. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something. Literally, uh, I love this. Like, if anybody's an underdog, okay, like, I'm an overcomer. Um, I have massive scars on me. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe not like scars you can see. I have been burned. I have burned people. I have screwed people over. They have screwed me over. I have lied. I have cheated. They have cheated me. I have lied. Hurt people hurt people. I was a very hurt person my whole life. I hurt a lot of people. Mm -hmm. My wife was my saving grace. Mm -hmm. My wife was that mother I needed. My wife was that heart. My wife was the one that said, you're a good man. And I was like, no, 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 I'm going to kill it. She's like, you're a good man. Like, you're a good guy. You're a good person. You're going to do big things. Mm -hmm. You're going to use your cells for good things. Do you remember the first day you met her? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I told her to come to this party with me. And she was like, no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. And um, anyway, she was like, look, if you call me back at this time and you really want me to go, I'll meet you there. Mm -hmm. It's like she was like, like Testing a game, yeah. right? Where'd you first meet her? Uh, well, she, she, so I live in Oklahoma. She lives in Arizona. She, she flew to Oklahoma to take a job in the finance department at a competing store, mm -hmm. but it was on the same block. So I kept seeing this Mexican girl walk by with this fat ass. <laughs> and I was like, damn, who's that girl? Green eyes. And I would just follow her around. And anyways, I was just like, you know, like, yeah. but, but we worked in different buildings. You're working but, on the ultimate sale there. Yeah. yeah. But, but my yeah. point is, but I met her at the, at the bank. I was at the bank. She was at the bank yeah. and I was like, Hey, why don't we hang out? And she was like, no. And I was like, well, give me your number. We'll talk about it later. We'll figure it out. Right. And so anyways, but she ended up going out with me. Now that night, mm -hmm. um, she did go out with me that night and man, I was drunk being a retard. I mean, I'm an idiot, dude. Remember, I don't have any good leadership. Like I got to tell anybody this. If you're around the wrong people, you're going to be an idiot. It's just the way it is. Like you're a product of who you're around. Okay. Like honestly, like, dude, I was super skilled. If I could just come to this era that we're in now and I could go back to my twenties and have a good leader now, like I would have killed it. And you were making money at this time and still didn't have the best environment around you? No, because how many people right now make money that are miserable, bro? Right. Can I ask you a question? What value is it to make a lot of money, right. right? And then be around people that don't treat their wives good. Right. Dude, everybody around me cheated on all their girlfriends. Mm -hmm. That was the sales industry. Yeah. Like, listen, times have changed. Right. And I'm not saying that that shit doesn't still exist, but I'm trying to, I don't know about it now because I'm in a whole different life. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm guessing it still exists. Mm -hmm. But like that was, that's how things work. That make was the a, make yeah. a lot of money, uh, chase ass, kick ass, like be a badass, call your shots, go get it. You know, like, like fight, like just do stupid stuff. Like honestly, yeah. like everything against what I believe in now, I was when I was a kid, except selling. And by the way, I want to tell you something. I, I worked for sales back then because I wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. Now, when your intentions change, everything changes. Mm -hmm. Dude, the day my intentions changed and I matured up and I was like, dude, I want to help people. Like, I really want to help people. That's when I started making a million and a half, two million, two and a half million. And by the way, then I was leading a team. Mm -hmm. And then I was making people better than I was. Like, mm -hmm. most people's, most leaders can't make their team better than them. I was making my team better than me. Everything that I knew I wanted to teach them, these were my kids. People say, well, if you teach them to be great, you know, they could leave and go somewhere else. But if you teach them to be great, maybe they stay. I believed that everybody was going to stay. I almost became like a cult leader in my company mm -hmm. on just like, this is a standard. This is what we do. This is how we live. But like a cult for good, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. don't cheat on your girl like be good to your family like do things right and my wife was teaching me to create this environment of of good stuff that was the opposite of what i grew up in mm -hmm. my first 10 years in the car business were crap mm -hmm. lots of money bad person i'm gonna be honest with you like for real like i wouldn't i i, I wouldn't i wouldn't want to hang out with me back then mm -hmm. now was i cool yeah i was cool what was driving you then <laughs> just didn't want to be poor no more so, because I want to zoom in, because a lot of people will hear this. I myself started in sales door to door selling solar. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for Vivint. I don't know if you're familiar with the company. But yeah, I just did their opener. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So I um, I used to knock doors, and that that's what happened to me. I was at a Tony Robbins event, and people were around. The guy next to me was making four hundred grand a year in his twenties. I was like, how the hell is this guy? And that was his base salary, and he his dream was a higher uh, higher goal. And I was just like, man, how how is this guy? Like my dream at the time was a hundred grand. I didn't know it was possible. Yeah. So I got into solar. I got into selling door to door. It changed my whole life. But I want to ask for you, what was the driving factor? Because a lot of people come from a poor background. They get into sales. Maybe they get that first sale and they do okay. And they kind of stay at 50 grand, a hundred grand and kind of coast. What for you was driving that level up every, what was the pain inside that kept you hungry and didn't get comfortable? The second you had 20 grand, 50 grand, a hundred grand in the bank. Like what kept the fire alive for you at that time? 
honestly, just no one ever believing in me. Mm-hmm. Like, honestly, just proving everybody wrong. And I know that. So it's like I, dark energy a little bit? Super dark. Yeah. Yeah. I was in a really dark place for a long time. And by the way, like, I think it's okay to go dark. Yeah. Like, it's, it's totally yeah. cool, right? Like, there's a healthy place in the in, to shine your light in the dark, right? Because mm-hmm. the world's pretty dark right now. Um, but, like, there's a lot of good in it. But, like, you're going to go through some dark shit. Like, you're going right. to go through some hard stuff. But the biggest thing is proving everybody wrong. I know everybody says that, and it's so cliche. I want to prove everybody wrong. Um, I'm, a, I'm a broke person right now with money. Mm-hmm. Um, I never need to work again if I don't want to work again. Mm-hmm. I need, I, my, and my kids are good. And my fam- I've got my family in a very good place right now. Mm-hmm. I, feel like, I feel like someone's trying to take it all away from me right now. I feel like I'm going bankrupt. I feel like... I have a chip on my shoulder and I feel like someone's trying to just annihilate my life. How do you how do you recommend people create that chip or create that drive? Well, Patrick Bet David wrote a book and I and I wouldn't read it till twenty years later, and it was called Choose Your Enemies Wisely. Mm-hmm. And he talked about somebody was making fun of his dad because his dad got a divorce and he was like, Hey, don't disrespect my dad like that. Yeah. And he was like, Nobody's gonna talk to my father like that. Nobody's gonna talk to our bloodline like that. That's how that wasn't my deal. My deal was I remember remember that poor kid mm-hmm. that was being judged? Dude, I remember, and I'm going to give you a quick story because I'm going to snapshot this, but I, w- I want you to feel, because listen, everybody, like, put yourself in my shoes for a minute mm-hmm. and find a place because you have to tie an emotion and anchor. Like, if you want to go from A to B, you got to figure out why you want to get there, and then you got to tie some emotion to it, and you got to anchor it to something that really pisses you off. So if you don't want to get out of bed at 5 a.m. to do the cold plunge, if you don't want to keep pushing whenever it's hard, if you know that you need to do this, but you don't want to do it, why you would do it anyways when no one else would do it, when you want to quit, but you don't quit, what would... It's, it's anchored to something that really just pisses you off. Yeah. And I know mine. Okay. And it's crazy because, like, you never know what that thing will be. Right. Eighth grade, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to go. There's all these girls going to the lake. Right. And by the way, like that mom, she was the antichrist. She was the rich mom. Yeah. Um, she had a beautiful lake house down at Lake Texoma, which is in Oklahoma and, and, and Texas. And it was called Lake Texoma. And they had a beautiful lake house. Now, all the kids that, that would go and she would let them stay at the house. Um, they had to bring $20. Mm-hmm. Now, listen, I went to my dad and I go, dad, can I have $20, please? I'm going to go to the lake, this lake house and my friends. There's all these girls going, dad, please. Can I go? Can I go? My dad's like, you know, we ain't got $20, dude. Mm-hmm. Like I ain't got $5 like that. It's not an option. Well, dude, I cheated everything else in my life. I jumped every fence. We'd go to an amusement park. They would go through the gate. I jumped the fence. Mm-hmm. Like I always found a way in. I always snuck in. I'll come in through the ceiling. I'll figure out how to get in. The third door, yeah. Yeah, but like, but like, and it's not good. I don't want anybody to do that. But like, I'm trying to tell you, like, that was, that was the hustle. You know what I'm saying? When you're broke, you hustle. You figure out when there's no lunch money. I grew up, there was no lunch money. What'd that mean? You go to school, there's no lunch ticket, there's no lunch money. Either you don't eat, you're like, hey guys, I'm not hungry today. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have money or you hustle. Can I borrow a quarter? Can I borrow a quarter? Can I borrow a car? And then you get enough for lunchtime. Yeah. It's like it's like just a hustle game. But I remember this though. My best friend goes, dude, you know how my mom is. It's a two hour ride to the lake. My older brother's gonna give us a ride. If you don't have twenty dollars, don't go. My mom, she's not gonna have it, dude. She doesn't like you anyway. She's like, I'm gonna be really clear. But if you don't have twenty bucks, she's gonna be pissed. And I already knew hell was gonna break loose. Dude, there were some hotties down at this lake. And I'm in eighth grade. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> going to the lake. Yeah. So I tell my buddy, I'm like, dude, I got 20 bucks, man. My dad said I'm good. Of course, I'm like, figure it out when it comes up, right? right, right. Sales 101, early on in life. <laughs> right. But guess what? Um, I, I go two hours to the lake. As soon as we pull up, there's about five kids that walk to the front of the house, our best friend. And she goes, all right. First thing she says, I can't even, it's no hugs. Hey, welcome to the place. I mean, we're, dude, we're kids. I'm 13 years old, bro, maybe 12, mm-hmm. okay? She goes, do you guys have your $20? Does everybody, did your parents give you $20? And she's kind of looking at me. Like, mm-hmm. she, like she's already pissed I'm there. Yeah. And, um, and she said, oh, yeah. And one of my buddies like, oh, my mom gave me $80 to give you. She said, thank you. And I'm like, son of a bitch. Yeah. Like, why is everybody so rich around here? Like, why? Like, I'm always this like bum kid mm-hmm. rolling and it ain't my fault, dude. I ain't not screwing anybody. Right. And, but watch this. This was good. This was a lesson. So I want everybody to think about this. I still think about this this day and I'm 44 years old. This is how I know I need choices. This is how I know life isn't fair. And I needed this. This was good for me. This, and you guys will hear this and you're like, I can't believe that I needed this. She goes, um, 20, 20, 80, 50. And then she came to me and she goes, Andy, 20 bucks. And I go, uh, oh, I left it in the truck. And she's like, good. I'll go out there with you. Let's go. 
And I'm like, dude, this isn't going to go right. So like I'm walking around, I'm looking in the back of the truck. I'm, and I'm like, I don't know where it went. It could have blown <laughs> out. And she goes, she goes, you're a liar. She looked at me right in the eye. She just stared and she goes, you're a liar. She goes, you're poor. You're a piece of shit and you're a liar. And I don't like you hanging around my son. You're a bad influence. And again, you're poor. Mm -hmm. You're not coming. You're not coming in our house this weekend. I was there for a week. She goes, you're sleeping on the porch. You're not coming in. I'm not even playing. You're not eating any food in this house. You're on your own. I remember I was like, like, okay, like this can't, like this couldn't be real, but oh, it was fucking real, dude. Mm -hmm. Like they all went in the house, they shut the door. And then here I am two hours away from home out the lake. I'm sitting on the porch and I'm just like, I hate being poor. <laughs> Like, I hate being poor. Yeah. Next day, she came out. All so you the literally kids, spent the night overnight. Yeah, I slept on the porch outside of this lake house. The next day, and I, I was going to tell you this because I know somebody has been treated wrong at some point, and somebody did something to someone. Sexually abused, made fun of, called out. Something's, something's happened to somebody. Patrick Bet David in his book, Choose Your Enemies Wisely, he said, write down what they said and write down their name. And make sure that when you, when you read it, you can attach emotion to it. That, that will make you fucking dangerous. And, dude, it did. It made me really dangerous. By the way, I was there for a week. The next day, she made she brought out sandwiches to all the kids. Um, I didn't I didn't get a sandwich. I fucking sat there and watched my friends eat. And I was like, and one of my buddies was like, "Hey, dude, you can have half mine." She's like, "Don't give him half your sandwich." Listen, all you guys, listen up. Anybody feeds him, okay? You're not fucking eating. I'm like, dude. Number one, I don't have a mom. I'm not close to my dad. Like, like who? I'm not going to tell. Like, what do you do? Well, number yeah. one, back, back in those ages, we just suck shit up. So my point is that I was just like, dude, this is like, like, this is life. Yeah. And so um, anyways, my buddies kind of snuck me some snacks through the week. Dude, I was starving that whole week. We went on the lake. We messed around. We ran around. Yeah. Um, I just bummed. I stole yeah. in the gas station. Yeah. I just did me. I mean, yeah. because that's what I did. Did you end up meeting the chicks that you went there for? Yeah. Yeah, I had a great time. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I slept on the porch, so I had no curfew. I was running around all night. <laughs> Made the best of it, yeah. But, but the problem is, is that sleeping on that porch for a week was the best thing that ever happened to me. I learned that I was on my own, and I was on my own until I met my wife. When I met my wife, my wife knew that I was a big project. And so you asked me, you said, like, like why do you have this chip right now? Look, we built a nine-figure plus business right now, and we're going psycho. We get 150 million views every 30 days on social media. We, we literally, when I say this to you, um, I never picked up a camera or got on social media until 2019. I'm not aware of any of this stuff. I just know if someone can teach it to me, I can learn it. My wife, when I got with her, she started to teach me real quick how to be a leader, how to be good to people, how to have empathy, how to really care, how to not be a fraud. Like I was a king of being a fraud. Like I could act like this, but I was really like this because mm -hmm. my whole life I was played by people. Sure. So like I was the king of playing other people. Like we were just, we were just, I was like a puppet master mm -hmm. or like people were a puppet master for me. I right. was also easy to play right. because I was always looking for loyalty and love. So who I try to get my loyalty to is always the wrong people. Mm -hmm. Dude, I, I trusted the worst people and they always screwed me. Mm -hmm. And my wife, when I got with her, she was fine. Like, I'm going to guide you to like, to like become the man. My wife told me she got with me. Mm -hmm. um, so the second night we got together with her first night, she wouldn't kiss me. I told you, I was like, well, I was hanging out with her. But then at the end of the night, I tried to kiss her and she wouldn't kiss me. She's like, I'm not going to kiss you. She's mm -hmm. like, if you want to hang out, call me tomorrow, but I'm not going to kiss you. And that was the first time I'd really been like rejected by like, I was like, I was like, what's your problem? And mm -hmm. she's like, I don't have a problem, but like, I'm not one of these other chicks you're going to roll with. Mm -hmm. I'm out. She's like, if you're going to roll with me, like things are going to be different. And how old are you at this time? I'm 26. Okay. And I'm just like, I'm like, I don't like the way she's talking to me. Yeah. And I like that. <laughs> I'm like for the first, and, and by the way, yeah. about a week later, we, you know, we were still hanging out and I was like, Hey, you. She, she spent the night at my house, right? Mm -hmm. And then every day I just wanted her to stay with me. I was like, don't go. She's like, I'm going to go home. I'm like, no, don't go home. Why don't you stay? Why don't you stay? Yeah, yeah. And she's like, listen to me. If we're going to be together, she's like, I'm not, you're, it's, I, I'm not seeing anybody. So we're going to hang out. If you have like other girlfriends or other things, she's like, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, I don't need you. I'm an independent woman. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm good. She's like, if we're going to hang out, we're going to hang out. But like, I'm not going to be, you're not going to play me. Yeah. There's no way. And, and my wife, she, and I was like, I, I could tell she was serious. 
but then like as like time went she was like if you ever cheat on me like under any re- if you get drugged if you get drunk if you do any if we have kids anything that happens if you ever cheat on me I, you'll never talk to me again ever you'll never hear from me again she's mexican she's like oh you'll never see me i swear to god in my life she's like if i i'm giving you the power to hurt me and trusting you that you won't i'm telling you she's like i've been hurt my whole life you've been hurt too so i need you to make a commitment you're not gonna hurt me and i'm like oh my god i gotta grow up now yeah. and so i grew up greatest thing i ever did that's how i became a good leader i started being good to my wife started leading her now I can go into the second part, but the leadership part is like, now I'm leading this team and I'm at work all the time. I'm at work from seven in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. And I did what most people don't do. This is what I preach is that take your family with you because I'm going to tell you if you don't one day, they're going to tell you they learned to live without you. Mm. And that's exactly what she did. See success to me because I had shitty leaders was filling my wife's purse full of cash, paid off homes, paid off cars. Um, I don't know. She can do whatever she wants. Yeah. Dude, my wife, one day I came home from work and this is kind of when I went psycho. Like, so we can go to the point when I, at 39 years old, I changed. If anybody's watching this, I would tell you, you don't want to waste 20 years. Okay. So you need to listen real carefully. Um, a rich life and getting rich is the goal. If you have a family or if you have things that are important to you, don't chase this and lose this. Because if you get this, you're going to have a hole in your heart this big because you lost this. Mm -hmm. And even though you have money, you're going to hate yourself. Mm -hmm. And I see this happen all the time. I see people today, and you always say be careful to be meet the people you look up to. I've met every big influencer, and 99% of them, I don't want to be them. Mm -hmm. I see the look. They 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 preach, take care of your wife, and they yell at them behind the camera. Mm -hmm. They say, yeah, be close to your kids. They're not close to their kids. They put them on electronics and they travel. Dude, that's not it, man. I'm. Te- By the way, my wife, remember this. She's my mentor. She's my mom. She's my fantasy. She's my wife. She's my everything. She's my best friend. She's my counselor. She's my workout partner. She's my, dude, she's my everything to me. Mm-hmm. And so like, by the way, I used to think she was nagging me when she would tell me, but what I learned is she was actually trying to protect me, the only person trying to level me up. Mm-hmm. Dude, if you're around somebody that tells you the truth and pushes you, that person loves you. If you're around people that don't push you and allow you to stay the same, those people don't care about you. And most of the time we try to please those people and the people that want to push us, like our family at home that tells us, hey, babe, you're home from work. Can you put your phone down and be with your family? We missed you all day. Mm-hmm. We're like, come on, babe, I got shit I got to do. I got things. Like, dude, like, listen, man, you expect them to support you? If you got sick right now, would all those clients be there? Mm-hmm. Would, would your job be there? Would those people be there? Would those people be there with you in your deathbed when you got sick and you had cancer? Or would your wife be there? Wife. Oh, but you want her to, to not ask for more? Dude, my wife has one simple deal. I've learned it. I know what it is. She wants to be number one. Mm-hmm. Dude, any time she's not number one, we know God's number one. But if my wife isn't number one in this world, I assure you, she's not going to support me. She's going to cut my legs off and there's hell. <laughs> there's always hell. By the way, yeah. women can cut your legs off or they can support you and build you to be great. Yeah. That's what women can do. Yeah. And they want to treat you like the king. But if you don't take them with you, by the way, a lot of people have a lot of different takes on stuff, right? But with me, my wife, my personal life. So if you compete with me, right? Like my life right now is so good. Me and my wife are marriage millionaires. It means like, even if we don't have money, me and her are on fire. We're growing every day. Our marriage is falling more in love with each other. We're psycho competitors in our marriage. We, we, we like treat our marriage like it's day one every day. If you treat something like it's the beginning, there'll never be an end. We flirt with each other. We play. We have crazy sex every day. We do all kinds of stuff. We've been married 18 years. Yeah. Wow. Well, but watch this. Yeah. Dude, didn't she marry me for the ride of a lifetime? Yeah. Or did she marry me to become a dud, you know, get fat on her, get out of shape, not take care of her, become a loser? Dude, yeah. my wife could have got rich without me, dude. She don't need me. I'm going to tell you this. Be honest, my wife's a killer, dude. She was going to make it without me. She was going to marry a badass dude. She was going to be a badass. It didn't matter. Like, dude, I got lucky. She took a bet on a project, and she bet right. <laughs> it took a while for yeah. her to, to ma- babysit me, to get me to understand. But, like, I'm just, I'm just being, like, total transparent, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like she was the one that believed in me when no one didn't. And she stuck by my back when other people burned me. And so like a lot of the times we go shit on those people and we're really good to other people and you need to rethink your whole life. Mm. And so, um, but when my wife one day, see, remember this, I, I have grown a big business fast by one simple deal. I'm direct. I'm super direct with everybody in our company. I don't walk on eggshells. You know what that means? Yeah. If you're doing something that I don't like, I'm going to tell you now 
I'm not a dick. My heart's on my sleeve. I'm like, dude, I love you. Like, you know, I care about you. Like, look, do you think that what you did, like, number one, does it, does it make you respect yourself more? What you did? Um, does that help the company raise their standards? Is that your core values that you believe in? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'll be direct when I see things going on. And I ask my team to be direct with me too. We built a company off being direct with each other. Why? Because those are the people that really care about you. And that's how you're going to build a big ass business. We don't want to walk around on eggshells. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, I can't say this around him. I don't want to hurt his feelings. Toot around here. We will hurt each other's feelings like crazy. But we know we're on the same mission, the same page. And our goal is to make each other better. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to call each other out. That's what real boys are. That's what real family is. Mm -hmm. Um, So I have 100 people in my teammates, employees in our company. Company, and we all call each other out every day. Totally, that's why we grow. We love the shit out of each other. Mm-hmm. It's the most amazing thing ever. But my wife, yeah. you know, she said, I learned to live without you. Mm-hmm. And when she said that, I'm going to tell you this. A lot of you are like, dude, I can't believe that. She's got a paid off car, paid off house. It's badass shit. I had to drive her son, purse full of cash. She has her own life. She's built her dream home. Dude, my wife, she's like, dude, I, I married you because like you were going to be a badass dude I was going to look up to. I see you motivating your team. You don't motivate us. Mm -hmm. I see you having your sales meetings with your team. You don't even motivate your kids. Again, I'm like, I don't like this. And she's like, it's the truth. You know, if you want to get coached by anybody in life, you'll understand that you have to go back to the truth before you can be coached. You have to be honest with yourself. If you really said, I want to change my life right now, Mm -hmm. I would say, okay, well, we got to be honest. Mm -hmm. Because we can't go with how you feel or what we think. We just got to be really honest. Yeah. When I wasn't saving money, it's because I was wasting money. I had to be honest with myself, look at the bank account, and realize I was wasting money left and right. Yeah. And I had to own that shit, and it really sucked. And I gave my wife my credit cards, and I was like, dude, I'm not responsible. Did you yeah. ever almost go broke in the journey, even yeah, while you we were, were making money? Yeah, we were plenty of times. Really? Yeah. What was maybe a rock-bottom moment, just to relate to people? Because I'm sure there's people watching, and they feel the weight of that. We were just talking with Dean House. That's sometimes the worst pressure ever. Because you got financial pressure, you can't think straight, you can't be present for your family. Can't oh, achieve. yeah. So how bad did it get financially for, for you guys? Well, I mean, there was two times. I mean, one time in 2008, right, 2009, remember when the market crashed? Yeah. Me and my wife just got married. We were killing it. She was making like 30 grand a month. I was making like 30 or 40, 50 grand a month. Like I was, like we had a good income together. Yeah. And so we like bought this uh, big piece of land. We were going to build this million dollar house on, which in Oklahoma is like a lot of money. Cause like right. Oklahoma, like you can get like five cheeseburgers for $5. <laughs> right. And in Scottsdale, it's like one cheeseburger for a hundred. Right. Like it's, yeah. it's like different place. Like yeah. you're talking about redneck town. Yeah. And um, anyway, so we're building this million dollar house. We have this uh, land that we bought. That was a $500,000 piece of land. It was super cool, beautiful mm-hmm. woods, trees, everything. Well, this, this land, right. That we bought, we almost had it paid off. We almost had our house paid off. We almost had, we had a big lake house. We had boats. We had big lifted home. We had all this stuff. Now you, now you say, Andy, I thought you said, tell me about the time you're broke. Okay. I'm gonna tell you real quick. The, the market flips. We go from like having like a million and a half of equity to like being upside down 500 grand. Wow. Like it's like, it's like the land that was 500 grand, like was worth now like 50 grand. Mm-hmm. Our lake house that like was worth a 600 grand that like the one just sold next to us for like five or 600 grand and our house was nicer. Like it went down to be worth like 120 grand. Mm-hmm. Dude, like, ev- like everything you worked for. Yeah. Like everything was worth nothing and we're upside down on it all now. And we didn't see it turning around or changing and at that point like we wanted to start having a family and my, my first son and i was like this sucks man and i'm like we don't like it's like an unfair deal like we didn't do anything to cause this it was just it was just timing we could have wrote it out and let all the equity come back in you know but like we we're like screw this dude we're like, we're just going to, we're going to get out of debt. We're going to sell everything. Wow. And so we just started selling everything and losing money on everything. And me and my wife, we moved to the lake, me and her together. And this is, and this is a time where I really wanted to get my life right. Remember my wife, she always told me, she goes, you're going to be somebody great. You're going to change a lot of people's lives. Dude, I literally, I was, this is when I gave my life to God between 20, 2008 to 2011. I started like wanting to become something different. Finally in 2011, I raised my hand and I was like, all right, I'm gonna give my life to God. Like I'm all in. I remember crying. I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna forgive myself for my old life. Like, here we go. Like I'm all in. Like I finally felt grace and I was ready to just be a good man to my family. Right. Like, like I never cheat on my family. I just want to be a good man. Like inside, I just had demons all living in me. I was this freaking, just, just years of trash and programmed. Right. Um, but I remember that I wanted to be a preacher. 
Mm. And dude, listen, I started, my wife would read the Bible to me every night. I'm not a very good reader. I can read, but she's way better at reading. Yeah. And she would start reading children's Bibles to me. And, and I would learn scripture and I loved it. And I would just start memorizing all these scripture. Like I could memorize word tracks. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I would memorize all the sales word tracks as a young guy. Yeah. So now I was memorizing scripture and I knew all this scripture and I got really good at it and I started investing. And by the way, at this time we were broke and, um, cause we moved to the lake. And so like I only worked four days a week, I was making good money, but we're paying off the 500 grand and negative, yeah. right. That we had, it was like, we were working from a hole. My wife drove a $3,500 car. I drove a $1,500 car. I was making like 50 grand a month, but we were just paying off debt. At this time, me and her were like eating beans and rice and shit. My wife, because she's like, we're getting out of debt. How old are you at this time? Um, I was probably 29, mm-hmm. you know, maybe yeah. about three years after we were married. Yeah. And uh, we just started to have our kid. But, th- but, but the main deal is, is that we humbled down, but me and my wife got really close. Mm-hmm. And I got really close to God. And I remember that like, like every day, like I he was like riding with me to work. Like I was just talking to him. Like I was just... Like it was cool, like so cool. But like, I'm going to tell you, like the Elliott group today is a ministry. Like it's a real ministry, man. We have 500,000 people on our training platform, 500,000. We have 10,000 companies. Dude, we smoked Grant Cardone the first year of sales training. We literally smoked him out of the automotive business fast. I took him out in one year. When did you transition from? 2019. Really? So 2019, what was the catalyst to making that decision of? Um, I'm going to change my life and my business. Well, so like that position, that mm-hmm. deal, give my life to God, want to do all this stuff, trying to change. I was like, okay, cool. I need to go back and start financially taking better care of my family. So we moved back to the city. Mm-hmm. Well, the job that I took when I moved back to the city, um, there was this owner that was like, I want you to come be a general manager for our company. And um, it was a special finance company. And, you know, he's like, I'll pay you all this money. It was a couple hundred grand a month that I was going to be making. And um, like, this was my chance to get my family ahead. Right. And I, all those things that we learned together, right. I, I slowly started to chip those things away being mm-hmm. back in the city, um, 7 AM to 11 PM at night. I remember my wife, this, my wife's a good wife. When I tell you this, you're gonna be like, damn, dude, you got a good wife. Um, my kids, I used to come home at 11 o'clock at night and my wife used to keep our kids up until I got home. Okay. Because mm-hmm. she and her friends would be like, dude, I can't believe, you know, like, like it's unhealthy for you to keep your kids up till 11 o'clock at night. And my wife would be like, it's unhealthy for my kids to grow up without a dad. So we're good. Like, screw you. My wife is always stuck by my side. And honestly, I feel like she wanted to speak up and she wanted to tell me that I needed to make some shifts. But I, I was saying things to her like, Hey babe, like, why are you nagging me? And if you tell your wife, why are you nagging me? When she sees something wrong, one day she's not going to speak up because you've, you've trained her to shut up. And so when you're in trouble and she sees you're in trouble, she's not going to speak up because she doesn't want to nag you. Mm-hmm. So like I took the person who was going to protect me more than anyone else in this world. And I put duct tape over their mouth. Yeah. And so I started doing business with the wrong guy and like literally like I almost went to jail. Mm-hmm. Like, like it was like this big FBI deal. By the way, mm-hmm. I, I didn't do anything wrong except for to go work for a company that was already doing some things that mm-hmm. I was trained to do that they were doing. And now that I'm a part of that company, it's like you're a part of what happens. The ecosystem, yeah, yeah. Bro, it's... Was there, was there a day where you realized, holy shit, like, this is less than kosher, or was it gradual, or how did you kind of get swept up into Dude, it? Dude, the car business is crazy. You're yeah. a door-to-door, Yeah. okay? Let me give you an example. I want you to answer what you would do. Sure. And I'm not going to put you on the spot, because you, sure. don't, you don't do this. Yeah. But I want to ask you, what does your sales brain tell you? Mm-hmm. Not what does the educated Omar tell you to do now. Yeah, yeah. What does your sales brain tell you to do here? Yeah. So you said that you're in door-to-door sales. Let's say you're a roofer. You know roofing business, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you're a roofer and you're going to work a storm, okay? And that storm, you see a, you you clearly look at a client's house and you can see damage from the road. Mm -hmm. So you go knock on the door. You say, guys, I see damage from your road. Do you have insurance? They say, yeah, I got insurance. You say, okay, cool. Let's go and sit down. I'll get your roof repaired. We'll get you a nice roof, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You sit down with them. You say, all right, looks like I can get it done. This is the deal. I'll set up the claim. You know, all I want to do is make sure I get paid for my efforts. I'll be here when the, when the guy shows up, I'll make sure everything gets done right. And I'll make sure we get a really nice five-star roof on. Was that cool? You guys paid for the insurance for 30 years. Storm came through. Finally, we're going to get you a new roof. It's going to increase your property value. It's going to be nice. We're going to, we're going to fix it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure I take care of you. You don't have to do nothing. Also, there's a $2,500 deductible here. Mm-hmm. Okay. And they say, well, we don't have the deductible. We paid our insurance for 30 years. Mm-hmm. We've never missed a payment. We didn't cause a storm. There's a hole in our roof. 
we need a roof. Hmm. What do you do with that deductible? Do you do you just say they paid it and then you file the claim and then the insurance pays the difference and you put a new roof on their house? Mm-hmm. Or do you say, I'm sorry, guys, if you don't have money for the deductible, I can't put a roof on your house. Mm-hmm. Sorry. What, do you, what does your sales brain tell you to do? Yeah. Do you know what happens in the industry right now? No. They just slide the deductible, fix the roof. Mm-hmm. How do they make money then if they don't get the deductible? Well, they get the full check for the roof. For the roof. Yeah, yeah because it's 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 like it's like you get a sixty-five thousand dollar roof, but then it says sixty-five thousand minus twenty-five hundred dollar deductible, and the insurance check is sixty-two thousand five hundred dollars. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. yeah. That sixty-two thousand dollars, five hundred dollars, is cut to the homeowner and the roofing company, mm-hmm. and then they fix the roof. But now the roofing company's got to do the roof for $62,500, yeah. but the deductible, it's not supposed to go to the insurance company. It goes to the roofing company. Right. But nobody knows if the roofing company collected it or not. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So what do roofing companies do? Mm-hmm. Do they fix the roof or do they walk away? Fix the roof. That's insurance fraud. Yeah. But if we walk away, we don't help the people. Mm-hmm. If you walk away, the next person that comes to the house is going to slide the deductible. Yeah. So you're in a market where everybody's sliding all the deductibles. Everybody knows it. It's clearly breaking the law. It's, it, this happens in every industry. Right. This is the gray area of sales. Mm-hmm. And if somebody wants to go after these people, they could go after them. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. If somebody goes, I don't like that company. I'm going to get the FBI. I'm going after them now. I could go after them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's what happened. Basically what happened, this owner that I worked for was a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. Total piece of shit, dude. He rubbed everybody wrong, caused problems with everybody. He's in jail now, okay? A lot of people went to jail because they were all bad people. But the deal is I was a general manager that worked there. And by the way, when you bought a car, I'm just giving an example, when you bought a car, um, everybody, we, so our uh, clientele was bad credit. And this is why you gotta be around the right people. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. Guys, go work for the wrong company. Don't be surprised when you have to do, and I'm a good person. I never yeah. hurt anybody. I never been out to, dude, you get caught up in the wrong shit. It's like rolling with your homies and they get caught with drugs and you, they get pulled over. You're busted too. Yeah. And you got to be careful on the way in because sometimes when you're new, you don't, they, they can be like, that's just the way it is, but toughen up and dude, you go, whoa, I guess death by a thousand cuts. Pretty soon you're doing it and didn't even realize. Dude, that, when you yeah. sit in shit for long enough, it doesn't stink anymore. <laughs> like yeah. that's what I was doing. I was sitting in shit. By the way, I was making more money than I ever made. Yeah. Th- think of a time where you're making more money than you ever made. Yeah. And they're like, bro, look, no, no, yeah, people don't get caught up on that. Dude, th- trust me, this is just how they do it. Yeah, 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 I know it says it's wrong, bro, but trust me, that's not how it is, bro. Trust me. It's like, it's like, okay, okay, okay. Like, like, dude, salespeople aren't very educated. Right. They don't run us through compliance class in most cases, right? Mm-hmm. So at, at my point of this being said is that these people would come in, they had a job, they had income, they were good people, but a lot of them, somebody got sick with cancer, somebody had a bankruptcy, somebody had something that happened, you know, maybe a divorce, so there was a repo. So these people had less than perfect credit. So all of them needed, needed like a thousand down or something. Does that make sense? Yeah. And what happened is like, like it would be like they would buy, the bank would approve them on a loan. Mm-hmm. They would come in on a bus walking with their kids. Mm-hmm. Everybody needs a car. And so like they would put a thousand dollars down on the contract so the bank would approve them because bad credit people gotta have a little skin in the game. Right. So like that deductible for the insurance company, right. there was like that thousand dollars down on like the contract. Mm-hmm. Those were like little things that were already happening when I showed up. Yeah. And when the FBI came in one day, they were like, You guys are doing this all wrong. And like you're all in trouble. And they wanted that owner, dude. That owner was a bad man. Did you so, almost go to jail? Yeah, everybody did almost go to jail. But I'm going to tell you what I did right. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. I listened to my wife. Dude, she saved me so many times. So there's two rules right now. Number one, make sure you marry a badass partner. Make sure you marry one. Make sure you find somebody to do life with who is great. And make sure you listen to them. And make sure you tell them, babe, if you ever see me stepping out of line, please tell me. Please. If I ever become ungrounded at any time, tell me. Please. Give them permission to correct you when they see you doing wrong. Mm -hmm. See, because I didn't do that. Because I was used to being this macho dude. I got to carry my family instead of me and my wife are going to do this together. That's why today you see my, I talk about my wife all the time. If you ever watch any of my shit, man, I talk about my wife. I give her credit for everything. She's a CEO of her company. She's built everything we've done. I'm telling you, I wouldn't be who I am without her. That's number one. And then number two, never lie. 
Never lie. I was raised to lie. I lied my whole life. A lot of us have a bad problem. Like some people like cheat, you know, like I don't cheat. Like, like some people do drugs. Like I didn't do drugs. Like I just grew up lying. Like we just, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. people like it's a bad habit. Like I would just lie like, Hey, where are you at? And I'm like, uh, I'm at the mall, but I'd really be at the grocery store. Right. Like it's just like white lies, like stupid shit. Like, I don't know why I'm so dumb. Like I would just, but my wife goes and she knew like I would, and I never cheated on her. I never did anything bad. I never remember. She drew some very hard lines and scared the shit out of me. Right. So like she made me really straighten up. But I had some, a few little other things I needed to fix. And my wife, by the way, this owner, and this is crazy. Like, I'm going to tell you this, like this stuff, like this could happen to anybody. And there's crazy stories that happen everywhere. But this owner, he goes, dude, he goes, I'm going to tell you this. If you guys lie, I'm going to kill you. Or if you don't lie, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. There's like five people in a room. He's like. Threatened, literally threatened them. Facts. Yeah. Omar, if you don't lie and you don't say what I tell you to say, I'm going to kill you. Facts. Do you understand? Yeah. This meeting happened. There was five of us. This is the day that all this happened. Because he knew the FBI was coming. So Yeah, he wanted to start planning for what we were going to do. Yeah. And, dude, I was like, I'm not fucking like that. Like, I don't, like, number one, I don't even know what the fuck's going on, right? right. Like, dude, you got to understand, like, you, shit gets real real quick when yeah. you don't understand what's going on. Right. But at this point, I, uh, I, I go home to my wife. I was really scared. How do I explain this to my wife? Yeah. And I go home to my wife and I say, um, this is what happened. This is what I've been doing. Number she got really mad at me. And she's like, um, you know, I can't believe that you didn't tell me none of this. And I just realized, man. So you, you hadn't been telling her this all along? Well, I wasn't really doing anything differently than I've been doing my whole life. Right, right. I mean, the car business was crazy, bro. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like going home and telling your your wife you, you didn't, they didn't pay the deductible on a roof. Like, you don't really know, like. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, like in sales brain here, if somebody's in sales, they're like, oh, I knew this. But like, if you're in sales, like it doesn't seem like you're doing anything wrong. There's black, white, and there's gray, and you don't know you're doing gray, right? Yeah. Like, and, and if everyone's doing gray, like. It's just normal. Like, yeah. it's just normal, man. And honestly, like I own all my shit right now. Like, I'm trying to tell you, like, I really wish I had a better leader. I, 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 if, I if I could change anything in my life, I wish when I was 18 years old and I got in sales, I wish that me today at 44 could have been my coach. I would have taught me compliance. I would have taught me to never lie. I would have taught me to walk away, never make decisions based off money. Never, right? I would have, I would have done all these things. But dude, I didn't have me. I didn't, and I didn't exist back then, so I can't change that. So by the way, and who I am today is all the shit that happened. Mm -hmm. So dude, this is why I'm so good now. This is why I do shit right now. This is why I won't make hundred million dollar deal on the table. If I gotta lie, or if I gotta do business with somebody I don't like, hell no. Bro, I ain't never going to go to sleep another night and, and not be able to sleep or try to go to bed and not be able to sleep. But my wife, this is what she told me. She goes, dude, and by the way, I haven't even got to like how we're blowing up now in business, but my, you'll understand really quick why. Because I'm grateful. When God gives you another chance, like you don't play around. Mm -hmm. Like this is, I always wanted to be used for something great. And I think he had to, he had to scare me almost to take it all away to make me wake up. Right. It's like this. You got kids? No. Okay. Are you married? No. Okay. Imagine if you had kids. Mm -hmm. And imagine if your wife called you and you're married and she said, our daughter fell in the pool. And I came out and she was in the pool. I got her out and she's not breathing. Mm -hmm. where, where do you go to immediately? God. You're like, oh, I, what, what are we talking about? Right. In a second, your whole life changes. Mm -hmm. And then she goes, wait a minute. Wait, she spit. Well, hold on. She's spitting up water. She's starting to breathe. All of a sudden, you're like, please, God, I swear, if you'll make my kid healthy, I swear to God, I'll be a better dad. Like, right. like that is what I went through, okay, like in life. Yeah. And everybody can relate to this, but most people change back. I never change back. This is why this dude exists. But my wife tells me, she goes, dude, don't ever, don't ever lie to me ever again. Tell me the truth on everything. I swear to God, we will take over the world. We'll kill it. But now you're in this spot. We're going to tell the truth. Andy, the Bible says the truth will set you free and you're not going to lie. That's it. You're not going to lie. We do not lie in this house. We will not lie. You will tell the truth. You'll tell every bit of the truth and whatever happens, happens. And I'll stand by your side. Swear to God. Holy I don't care. Shit. How old are you at this time? Probably 33. And so, is, and so you know you have to tell the truth to the FBI and you're going to put someone that you worked for in a bad situation. No, no, no. Nobody even cared about me anyways. Yeah. Bro, they just told me they were going to fucking kill me. Yeah. Bro, they, these people never, they, these people never took care of me. Mm -hmm. 
These people never, they used to tell me to fucking divorce my wife. Mm -hmm. These people were never my friends. I wasn't putting someone in a bad, I didn't, I didn't rat someone out. Bro, these people were never with me. I worked for a paycheck to produce results in a company that I hated. Mm -hmm. But I was so afraid to walk away from the money because I was making more money than I ever made. Can you relate? Yeah. Have you ever made more money than you ever made and you just hated where you're at, but you yeah. didn't leave because you stayed for the money? Yes, absolutely. That was where I was. And then just the bullet of it was, someone came in and said, everything's done wrong now. And I'm like, I fucking knew I should have left. Why am I so dumb? I, I've said this to myself so many times. I'm like, why am I so dumb? Like, why am I? I'm such a good guy, but why am I so dumb? And then literally, my wife goes, you're going to tell the truth. And I, when she said that, I finally felt peace. Like, I'm going to tell the truth. Like, for the first time in my life, I don't have to scheme. Mm -hmm. I don't have to plan. I don't have to play chess. I don't have to play anybody. Like, she just said, I got to tell the truth. So we got an attorney. Um, we just went down and just told the truth. I said to, everything. To the FBI? Yeah, I did it to everybody. Mm -hmm. To my lawyer, to the FBI, to everybody. And, and I quit the job. I quit everything. I said, I'm done. I'm just going to tell the truth. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. And that that period of time, those those next couple years, I studied. I, I, I recreated my mind. I got physically fit in the gym. I changed all these things. Um, we finally went to trial. Like, I just told the truth. By the way, listen to me. Here's the coolest thing. In the Bible, it's biblical. It says the truth will set you free. They tried to trick me, trap me, set me up. I didn't try to be on the FBI side. I didn't try to be on my attorney side. I didn't try to be on their side. What did I do? Just told the truth. I had to take myself back to that day, every situation. For two days straight, I told the truth on everything. And at the end of the deal, they said, Andy Elliott, get out of here. You never lied to the FBI. You never lied to anybody. You never lied. Get out of here. Wow. I told my wife, I was like. Were you worried about the potential of going to jail? Of course, every yeah. day. Yeah. Dude, listen, I'm going to tell you this. Tell somebody you're taking their life away, they'll, they'll change real fast. Yep. And so now you can understand why the Elliott Group's growing so big. And by the way, I'm going to tell you something, okay? You may say, well, what if people find out? Everybody already knows. I've told everyone. You know what I tell people? When somebody's went through a hard time, shouldn't you want to build them up and say that your life from today forward is what matters and we can't change the past? I mean, if you're a good leader, wouldn't you say that to someone? Mm -hmm. Isn't it crazy that we're in a world where people like don't want to tell someone that they can have a better future, that they can change and that like they can like change their family. They can, if they once were a bad person, they can become a good person. Now we want to hang them on their past. Dude, 95% of the world like doesn't like like who they used to be and they have shame and regret and they've done something at some point that they hate they don't want to be that person anymore so like literally like i just want to tell people that like like dude like it's all about from today forward like i don't it's not about jim Rohn. like it's not about who you are it's about who you become so when i started watching this shit bro i started building a new identity yeah. i started watching all this coaching i started finding all these people and then i would study them and and emulate them and i would I would, I would learn what they were doing. And then the, the stuff I liked, I kept and then I left the rest. Mm -hmm. And then I built this guy here. And then I was like, holy shit, man. Like, I love who I am. And then I started training all these people to like do the same thing. And then I, I gave out content for two years for free from 2019 to 2021. I put out free content on YouTube every day for free. Me and my wife, we sold our million dollar house. We went and slept on mattresses, sold all our furniture, had the best time of our life, dude. We literally put all the money in the bank and I spent most of it on self-development. We, we literally uh, sold our house for a million dollars and I probably spent 800 grand on self-development. Wow. I spent all of it. Bro, I was building me like mm -hmm. this dude here. Then I was like, all right, now I'm ready. Now I'm not a fraud. Now I'm this real dude. Now I know who I am. Dude, I'm a freaking overcomer. I got a testimony. Look at me. I was fat. Now I'm in shape. My whole family's obese. They're out of shape. And I'm in shape? Dude, I recreated my DNA. I recreated my life. I changed my life. I'm not better than anybody. I'm just like everyone else. I just made a decision to change. And dude, I made these decisions that were all good. And I said, I'm never going to unchange. I'm still going to keep messing up, but I'm not going to mess up like that again. And I'm not going to become ungrateful. And by the way, once I realize what's possible now, and they gave the blueprint, all these people that I cut the check for to teach me, bro, like now I've become this. I'm living proof that anyone can make it. 
Dude, so like if you're alive and you're free or you're here, like just change. And then the secret is, Omar, is don't unchange. And so I was selling all the training. I, I dropped this course. I started dropping training. Was it 2019 when you started that? Yeah, 2019 free content, 2021, I started dropping training. What was the vision when you pivoted at 2019? Because And I want to ask because I know there's a lot of people in their own life and their career, whatever it is that maybe have that new thing on the horizon. So what was it for you, that internal decision, the identity shift, when you said, okay, I'm gonna go from doing what I do to teaching people at a global level in 2019? What was the catalyst for that? Well, I, I took that course, Broker Blueprint, yeah, the by Dean Graciosa, yeah, yeah and yeah. Tony Robbins. That's right. And I bought it for $3,000, and literally it said that you have a skill. You have a specialized skill. He kept calling it a specialized skill. You have a specialized skill. You have a specialized skill. You have a specialized skill. And whatever that specialized skill is, there's a lot of people that want that same specialized skill, and they would pay you to know what that is. And I said, what is my specialized skill? Mm -hmm. I'm like, bro, I know how to sell. Yep. I'm like, I'm really good at sales. I'm like, I'm going to teach people to sell. Yeah. Well, I, since I was in the automotive industry, that's why I told you I took Grant Cardone out. Mm -hmm. I go, dude, I'm going to give out free automotive training for the next year for free, and I'm going to make sure it's better than Grant's paid training. So I literally watch Grant's training, and he's got feathered hair, three-peat shoulder pad. No disrespect, Grant Cardone's a badass. I'm not knocking him in any way. Yeah. I'm trying to tell you that he recorded training that was 10 years earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Or eight years earlier, and it was still in the marketplace, and it wasn't up to date. And then here I am, like, dude, I can do better than this. Yeah. I'm like, I can change. So I started recording all this content. I gave it away for free on YouTube. And Google, which is you, the mother of the yeah. world, is like sharing YouTube videos to Google every time somebody searches how to sell more cars, how to increase your gross profit, how to overcome objections. And right. dude, like, like YouTube serving mm -hmm. Google all my videos, and I'm making like two or three a day every day of all this training. And next yeah. thing you know, bro, like people are freaking like commenting, like you changed my life, you changed my life, you changed my life. And so I'm using my specialized skill and I'm putting it out there, automotive, how to do this stuff. Yeah. I showed them, I'd use whiteboard, show them how to negotiate. I gave it all away for free. And then there's raging fans. And then I put this text number. I was like, text me if you need help, I'll answer shit. Dude, I got 200 text messages a day. I'm yeah. like, holy shit. I'm like, I ain't got nothing to sell. Yeah. Holy shit, I got to go create this course. And then I created this course and it was going to be like $299 because I just had to learn that it could work. I dropped it on New Year's Eve uh, tw at the end of 2020, going into 2021. New Year's Eve, dropped it that night, YouTube video. Hey, guys, I'm dropping this zero to 100K course, how to make 100 grand a year in sales as a new guy or to make 100 grand again and again and again. I'm going to show you how. Boom, 21 modules, 14 hours. Here we go, 299. Wipe your ass with it. Let's go. <laughs> Guess what happens? Woke up the next morning. Don't know what's going on. My wife had to create this Stripe account, which I don't even know what that is. I'm, and I, I look at it. And I'm like, damn, it's got 150 grand in it. Wow. And I'm like, shit, next day, 100 grand, next day, 100 grand, next day. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Woo! We're in business. Now I'm going to go. Those two years I worked in the dark, sleeping on mattresses, giving up all over materialistic shit, living below my means, spending almost a million dollars in self-development, all to get ready for this new life. I tell people all the time, cut the check. Cut the check for speed. That's what I did. Total immersion. Just like Tony says, dive in. What's your specialized skill? I know you know something that's good for you. We're in an era right now where communication is an all-time low. And here I am teaching people how to communicate, how to shake a hand, how to look at people in the eyes, how to talk, how to do this shit. So anyways, I just started teaching. I started building all these other courses, negotiations, how to, how, how to overcome objections. And then we started getting into generalized sales training after that. And then we started wiping out solar industry, wiping out pest control, wiping out roofing. We started going through all these other sectors, phone skills, pop, 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 pop. Next thing you know, we're just killing it. And then here we are. Uh, I, so I built a team one by one people that would come up in my coaching program yeah. that were true testimonies that they changed people that were freaking crazy that were lost on drugs that were drug addicts that were doing this these people came into my program started working out got in good shape became psycho competitors changed their life just like me we all have a different story but they were just like me and they're dude I can go introduce you to them when we're done you're gonna be like that guy that jacked up guy with an eight pack badass dude beautiful wife that dude no ways yes I was there with that dude when he overdosed on drugs. I was there with that guy. And now I've got a hundred of, of these soldiers that are all like the greatest testimonies ever that were the greatest students in my coaching program that they're not, they're not selling training like Grant Cardone's company. It's not like, hey, can you sell? Are you a high ticket closer? Can you sell? No, bro, these people are product of the training. Mm -hmm. These people had their life changed here in this company and they're never leaving. They're gonna die here.
Why? Because we built a family. Watch this. 99% of the people in this world can't retain their people. 99% mm -hmm. of companies can't retain their people. Why? Because they don't take care of their people. Yeah. Their people look for a better opportunity elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. Like, dude, try to go recruit one of my guys. Dude, they don't work for money. Dude, they work for blood, sweat, and tears because I, I, I give everything to them. Mm -hmm. Dude, like, I, I would die for my team. Like, yeah. literally. Like, and I'm cool with that. Like, like, it's unexplainable. Everything that I ever, okay, so basically everything I ever wanted my whole life, me and my wife decided that we were going to build this business and build everything that we ever wanted here. Um, I may have a few people making under six figures. Most of my company makes over six figures. Mm -hmm. Some make seven figures. We're only a new startup company. Um, I pay my people generously and I take care of my people because I want them to have a really nice life. Yeah. I want them to be taken care of. I want them to be good. Now, they have to work hard. They have to care. I don't need them. I want them. They don't need me. They should want me. They should want this company. We should mm -hmm. want these things. So we all protect it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't know any companies like this. I see people with turnover. Yeah. Our people here, they're like watchdogs. They watch everything. They take care of everything. They protect everything. And I pay them really good. I've had people plenty of times, right? And I'll just name 100 influencers that I'm with. Mm -hmm. And they always say, what do, you, so what do you pay your guys? And I tell them, they say, oh, you're an idiot. You know what? Who's the idiot? I have 99% of the people that I've ever hired that still work here with me. They've been here for four or five years. We're family. We do life together. They break records every single month. They kick ass. Their family, their wives, and their kids are all happy. Everybody has a great personal life, and we kick ass in business. You should see the way they take care of our customers. Mm -hmm. Dude, if you don't take care of your people, you think your people are going to take care of your customers? I'll pay more for my people to have a great life and take better care of my customers. Yeah. No ways. And so pay them less. But don't be surprised when they work for someone else in two yeah, years. That's really interesting. What for you has been the biggest challenge personally? Because a lot of people see you as this masculine alpha who's got all the answers, who helps people. But maybe on a more vulnerable side, what are some of the biggest challenges for you as you're scaling to this level? I'm sure you had to overcome a lot of limiting beliefs. What are the present day challenges you deal with that you're still kind of trying to figure out that are kind of tough for you to figure out? Um, so, uh, well, a couple of things. Number one, like I believe in people sometimes mm -hmm. more than they believe in themselves. Right. And so like, I just think that I can make everybody make it. It's always been a problem with me. Like, you know, some people just give up on people pretty easily. Like yeah. if you, if, if they don't hit their quota, me, like I'm always like, no, nah, dude, I'm gonna take another run with this guy. Mm -hmm. Like, so not giving up on people is probably one of my hardest things. Yeah. Because there's a time I should probably give up on someone. But I just find it really hard. Yeah. And I'm thinking somebody didn't give up on me. My wife didn't give up on me. So it makes me hard makes it hard for me to give up on someone else, right? Yeah, so that's a struggle with me, and it's a, everybody has their own struggles, right? Um, a, another one is um, here and there, just staying grounded. Mm -hmm. um, I have a big heart. I have a huge heart. Examine my heart. I promise you, dude, there's no darkness in it. Like, I have the best, like, I, like, I literally have such a good heart. I want to give everything, and I don't want nothing in return. Um, but because I have this big heart, like, I also get really pissed off whenever people aren't changing and they're letting their family down and they're making false promises to themselves. And so like sometimes I need to make sure that I show a little bit more of my heart, not to my team. My team, I, I do a very good job. Mm -hmm. But when I'm, maybe when I'm, I'm training or something, maybe I need to show just a little more love. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you know me, you know that like yeah. all I want you to do is just do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Like Patrick Bet David says, I'm the kind of leader that like, if you tell me you're going to do something, like I'm going to hold you to it until you do it. Yeah. So you're better off not telling me. Yeah. And like, I feel like I'm the same way. And, um, and I don't know how to do it anymore without being direct. Remember my dad was a pushover. So I used to hate conflict, but my wife is like fighting is good. We're going to fight. We're going to get it out of the way. And in five minutes, we're going to be good. We're going to hold any grudges and we're going to move forward. Mm -hmm. And I'm the kind of guy who I'd rather just hold a grudge and not fight for three weeks because I don't want to fight. Yeah. And that's not bad. For, that's, that's bad for me. That's how people get resentment. That's how they become nasty people. Mm -hmm. So, like, now I'm like, I want to fight quick. I want to get it out of the way. I want to do this. So, like, I just need to make sure that I wear my heart on my sleeve. I mean, it's like vulnerable side. Like, mm -hmm. I need to make sure I wear my heart on my sleeve because I really care about people. And when I see people make a commitment to themselves or their family, mm -hmm. like, I want to just see them hit it. 
And so like, if I'm going to be a good boss, remember this, if I push you really hard and to successful people, they would say that person really cares about you. That's why they're pushing the hell out of you. Cause they want you to max out their potential. Like they don't want you to cheat yourself of what you said you wanted. Right. The world would say, stop pushing that guy so hard, man. You're a dick. But those people, you're not hitting your promises. You're cheating yourself. You're cheating your family and they don't care. Hmm. Like, yeah. Who really doesn't care? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I would, I would say, if you ask me, those people don't really care about you because they're not helping you get any better and they see you backsliding and they're not speaking up. Yeah. What's the biggest limiting belief? Before I wrap up, I want to ask this. You know, taking a company to $100 million, that's not an easy task, right? You guys obviously put in a ton of work. You have a phenomenal team. But what's been the biggest limiting belief that you had to overcome to make it happen? Because I'm sure for you, you ran the numbers and ran the math. At one point, what you're doing now was an impossibility or was something outside of what you believed was possible. And the reason I ask is because there's people out there, whatever the number is for them, that have their own limiting beliefs. So what's Andy Elliott's best advice to kind of overcome your limiting beliefs? And what are the ones for you that changed the game for you? Well, you to overcome it, it it's going to be this. Don't change back. So, like, like if you learn something from this today, yeah. like, like, don't change back. Like... Like, just change and, like, never change back. Like, David Goggins says, he, I remember this. He says, I went to, I, I go to war with myself every day, my old self and my new self. And that's why he says, like, David Goggins and Goggins, right? And, like, I understand that. Like, so, like, I want you to understand, like, the old you, the old programmed you, that old loser, piece of shit, that person you hate, that person you're not proud of, that person that, you know, failed everybody, like that dude, that guy's dead. Like, so that guy, he can't come out anymore, okay? Um, so, like, I just wanted to say, like, to me, like, don't change back. It's like running a 26-mile marathon and going to mile 10 and turn around and going back to the starting line. Mm -hmm. It's like, come on, man. You're never going to finish a race, bro. And, and by the way, winners live where quitters quit. Say that again? Winners live. Like, the winners. Like, if you want, yeah. you, you want a $100 million business, the $100 million businesses live where the quitters quit. So it starts so, where the quitters quit. Yeah, yeah so, yeah. like, where you quit, like, we just kept going. Yeah. Like, we didn't quit. Like, like we didn't quit. How did Alex Ramosi get to where he got? He didn't quit. Yeah. But what was for you personally the biggest limiting belief? I'm sure there was like a biggest boulder, even uh, at this level. D w well, I mean, honestly, dude, I know that sounds crazy. I have to think about it because I really don't have any right now. Dude, I, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about me in like 10 seconds. Like I'm a self-development freak. Yeah. Um, I, I, ha I, I constantly stay on edge. Mm -hmm. I'm going to live like this till I die. What about people who say, good. Andy, how does he sustain that energy? Is it too intense? Like, it, what are your thoughts to it's humanize my routine. it to them? Uh, there's a book. Andy Frazella wrote it. It's the book of mental toughness. Yep. I'd recommend everybody buying it. Um, just go to andyfrazella.com, I think, and it's the book of mental toughness. And when you open it, a Andy Frazella starts the book by talking about, you, you want me to show you a magic trick. This is the truth. I just want, like, this is, but this, this is why I don't struggle with this right now. Yeah. Um, there's things I don't want to do. But I still do them because that's what winners do. But I don't really believe that nothing's not possible. Like, I'm, like, freaking brainwashed, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm in a good place now. But I want to tell you a magic trick. And, by the way, this has to match this, and then we'll wrap it up. But So in the book of mental toughness with Andy Frazella, it says, let me show you a magic trick. And Andy Frazella says, show me your last 500 days, right? I'll tell you your body fat percentage. Show me your routine for your last 500 days. I'll, I'll show you your body fat percentage. I'll show you how awesome your relationships are. I'll show you your bank account. I'll show you how what your leadership skills look like. I'll show you everything. I, I'll, I'll, sh I'll, I'll do a magic trick. I'll tell you your whole life if you can just show me your last 500 days routine. And I think what I did is that I, I don't, like every morning, if you watch my Instagram, I wake up with the cold plunge. Um, I'm always surrounded by good people, okay? I'm a collector of people. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm a collector of people. I, I find people that I really like, mm -hmm. and then I find a way to keep them next to me forever. Yeah, because that energy is important. Yeah. I, I need it. So I'm around, think about this, Omar. I'm around 100 people every day that are fire-breathing dragons that love life, that love people, that live for a bigger purpose than themselves, that love God, that wants their wives to admire them or their husbands, that want their kids to, be, to look up to them as their heroes, that take care of themselves physically, that wake up before the sun come up, and that literally self-development and study all day long, that watch their words, that listen, like, it, just everything in their life. They don't drink. They don't party. They don't 
hang out with people that are bad people. They're not toxic. They don't let shit come out of their mouth. Dude, they're all ultra pers- like protective of this life. And that's why the Elliott Group keeps growing because it's an environment to freaking grow. So um, I would say that my last 500 days, my routine, it's so on point and I won't break it for nothing. I travel the world all the time. I'm always running around no matter where I go. Like I was just with Bradley this last weekend. I ask him every morning. I'm like, Brad, cold plunge. Let's go, bro. We're going to Lifetime. They got a cold plunge. That's 30 minutes away. So it doesn't matter. We're going to cold plunge, bro. We got to go. Come on, babe. I take her with me. Come on, babe. Hey, we're going to go smash this gym. We're going to work out. Oh, no, we got to do this. No, we're going to work out. We got to do this. Like, that's what we do. Like, we don't, like, we don't break the routine. We got to, we, we, show me your last 500 days. When I saw Andy wrote that book and I read that, I was like, son of a bitch. He nailed it, man. Yeah. And so, and so like, anyways, all these little things add up. But the greatest thing that I can tell you is that self-develop until you die. Find people that have been where you want to go and study them. Uh, find someone that has everything in every area that you really like. If they're, if, you, if they're married, look, look, like right now, you don't, you're not married, you don't have kids. You can really study a lot of people right now. But when you get married, you got to study people that are also kick ass that also have good marriages. Because now you want to have a good marriage too. So you got to make sure that that person has a good marriage too because you can't look up to them no more if they don't. Right. Because I just can't do that, right? And then if they also have to be good parents. Because then when you have kids, you're like, dude, I want to find someone who's a good dad who kicks ass in business who also – and then you want to find someone in shape if that's important to you. Like when you want to be in shape, you don't hang out with people who aren't in shape anymore. Yeah. Why? It's not that you're judgmental. I train millions of people that aren't in shape. Dude, I've taken people that have lost two, three, four hundred pounds. Dude, I can show you some pictures right now that you're like, oh my God, it's not six pack or you're fired. It's mentality. It's standard. It's human excellence. When I went out to Andy Frazella's house and I literally saw his compound, his place, and I saw first form and his, his 380,000 square foot buildings, and I saw everything, the way the wheels were parked and the chairs are done and the sinks yeah. didn't have any water on them and the, and the energy drinks were all freaking and perfect the bathroom, and the ba- just everything and, yeah. and the standards of everyone in there. And then his house and the cleanliness and everything and the way they operated and the core values on the wall, but also the language. When the people were talking, they also spoke the language on the wall. It was in their words. I was like, son of a bitch. I'm like, I want that. And I came back and I created Elliot Army 3.0. Bam, we nailed it. So like, so like I study these people and I know what I want. And um, anyways, uh, life's life's special. We're, look, bottom line is anybody watching this right now, if you ever want to be a killer, this is your time. Number two, we're in an era right now, okay? We're like, in 1999, when I called somebody, they were either at the office or at home. And if you caught them at home, they had this thing on the wall with a cord. Yep. They would walk, and they didn't know it was you calling. If they were rich, they had caller ID, but really nobody had caller ID back then, unless you were rich. And there weren't port- I mean, you had a portable phone, you were a badass. There weren't cell phones, there weren't pagers. If, if you were at the dealership and I was going to sell you something, but then you left, I couldn't be like, hey, call them back, take the deal. Yeah. No, you had to wait until they went to an office or got to a house. Right. Like you had to just keep calling. Like, dude, we're alive in an era right now with social media, right? With freaking technology. Like everybody's asleep. People don't know how to communicate. It's like if you ever wanted to be great, like, dude, like take every dollar you have. Bet against yourself. Like bet on yourself, right? Um, take somebody who bet against you. Use it as fuel in your mind to get pissed off and, and go become a good person. Like become a great example, not only for yourself, your family. Break your own bloodline and then teach people how to break their bloodline. I love that. I love that. And then before yeah. we wrap up, I have one final question for the audience. And that is if there's a man or woman watching this right now, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world that's fired up, wants to change their life, but maybe they feel stuck or they're maybe think of the Andy Elliott, the version of you that was stuck and needed an opportunity. What's your best advice for someone to get out of a rut, get out of a funk and really change their life? What's step one? What S- do- step one is going to be um, plug in to some new information. Mm-hmm. Good stuff, like stuff that you want to become that you're not. Plug into it and keep watching it and you'll find that your mind will start to shift and it'll start weeding out that shit. So, so new information new people and new experiences. I love that you say tell the truth too. Yeah. Oh God, you got to tell the truth. And by the way, it starts with the truth, which means you also got to give yourself permission to have a new life. Like, dude, honestly, the best thing that my wife ever did for me, like she said, Hey, like, like you're going to make it. Like, I believe in you. Like, and I was, and I just, that's all I needed. Look, dude, the reason why you got to take care of your family because money motivates me. But my wife saying that like, she's proud of me will make me go tear someone. It'll make me, it'll, I'll kill I, I could do anything. I, I, I turn into this savage and like, you won't understand it until you're married, but like people don't, a lot of people don't value their marriages like this anymore. Mm. And, um, I saw you just bought a Ferrari too. 
yeah, I bought her a new Ferrari for Mother's Day. But yeah. like, but like, dude, she deserves way more than that. Honestly, right. dude, she, she, I mean, like, you saw it when she got it. She was like, I don't need this. Yeah. Dude, she's dude. She loves she loves her life. She loves you know what she loves. She loves it when I pay attention to her. Yeah. Dude, and that's why I tell you, like, listen, and we'll end on this. If you if you're a badass in business, but you don't have a good personal life. Okay, there's no balance in life. They don't give trophies for balance. They give trophy for results. <laughs> okay, so that. if you want the biggest results, listen up here. Because a lot of you are like, and I don't need a personal life. I'm going to kick your ass. Bullshit. I'll destroy you. If I love who I am, if I look in the mirror and I'm proud of me, if I'm physically taking care of myself in the gym every morning, if I'm close to God, if I'm, if I, if I'm taking care of my kids, if I'm taking care of my family, if I'm bringing good energy to my family, if I'm taking care of my team, if I'm taking care of my clients, if I'm living for something bigger than me, I go into work and I kick ass and I'm just as good as you, but my personal life is on fire, okay, and I've got purpose and you don't have, you're not taking care of your personal life, I'm going to tell you this, you're eventually going to burn out. You're eventually going to fade out. You're eventually going to start making mistakes. You're eventually going to do something. It may take a year or two for us to see what happens, but dude, that's what happened to me is that I kept holding my standard and I kept holding this thing and everybody that was ahead of us, right? Like how we took out all these sales training companies is that everybody that was ahead of us, eventually we started passing them just by holding the standard. And Andy Frizzella says human excellence, right? And he's like, dude, the standard, it's in the family life. It's also in the community and it's also in your business. My team, they have to have that standard everywhere they go and I have to carry it too. So there's no exceptions to this. And so anyways, like we flooded a lot of information out there, but I want to tell you this, um, I'm just all about overcomers and underdogs. And like, if you, like, if everybody counted you out, like, cool, they counted me out too. And then even when I came back and I made a lot of money, it all fell through my fingers when I didn't learn how to lead and I wasn't being a good person. Um, so I would tell you like, become a great person, take good care of yourself, take care of your fitness too. Cause I'm gonna tell you this sales and leadership will make you rich, but also sales is very stressful. So the reason why you need to work out and take care of yourself because your goal isn't to kill yourself, right? Your goal is to go take care of yourself and make a lot of money. And at the end of the day, dude, like you don't want to make a lot of money and then not like who you are. Either. Yeah. Success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Yeah. Art of achievement, art of fulfillment. You get both of those, you fucking win. I love it. And then Andy, where can people find you if they want to connect with you more and learn more about you and your sales training? Yeah. So, and by the way, like it's very simple, like official Andy Elliott is our, is our Instagram. Um, our, our YouTube is Andy Elliott. It's easy. And then people always ask questions and I just say, text me. So it's 918-210-0254. If you just text 918-210-0254, say, hey, I saw you with Omar. Ask me a question. What industry you're in? What do you need help with? Hey, if I can help you, cool, let's kick some ass. If we can't, I love you. I'll give you some advice, and we'll, we'll move on. I love that, brother. Andy, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Omar. Guys, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, follow Andy, and check out all the stuff he has coming up. Now go live those dreams. Until then, we'll see you next time. Peace. Hey, Hey guys, I just want to tell you the true one percenters, you made it till the end of the video. Do me a favor, share it with the friend that wants to go to another level. Make sure you like the video, comment below so I know who you are, set your notifications, and then subscribe to the channel. We got daily sales training videos dropping. I'll see you soon.